so about so much to do, um, the life of Richard Ravitch. He served as the seventh lieutenant governor of New York from 2009 to 2010. Um, born in New York City, he earned his degrees from Columbia University and Yale Law School, and he worked in his family's real estate development business, HRH uh, Construction Corporation. Um, he was asked then to chair uh, positions, g government positions, the New York State Urban Development Corporation and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and in the private sector, um, his tenures included chairman of the Bowery Savings Bank and as the chief owner representative in labor negotiations for Major League Baseball. Um, his memoir describes how uh, he found that service in the public sector offered a real sense of purpose. Um, as, he, as he was called upon to use his skills in financial management and negotiating political relationships, um, he has sometimes chosen to work without salary as he now intends to do as the new municipal finance, financial consultant for the city of Detroit's restructuring plan. Um, it's, this is a candid insider's account. It's instructive, engrossing, and even suspenseful uh, as you find him facing um, various conflicts, um, whether it be the MTA transit strike or the New York State's um, budget crisis during the, na the nas national economic downturn. Um, I, I found one um, paragraph in his, his, in his prologue very, uh, just as a, a good summation of how he approached writing the book. It's very accurate. It's, it is a personal memoir, but it's also a section of the reasons we seem unable to be honest with ourselves about the gap between the government services we demand and the taxes we are willing to pay and an account of how democracy works, that it has worked, does work, and must work. And for anybody who's interested in the, the public, how the public sector works with the private business um, and serving the, the needs of the community, it's, a, it's an excellent book. I encourage you to read So Much to Do, A Full Life of Business, Politics, and Confronting F Fiscal Crises by Richard Ravitch. And here he is to talk more about the book. Thank you very much for spending the afternoon with us. never done this before, so I'm really not quite sure what to say, but I appreciate all of you coming. Um, I never wrote a book before, never will again. Uh, <laughs> the publisher, who cares a lot about public things, uh, suggested I write an autobiography, because I was in the news a lot when I was lieutenant governor, and I sort of dismissed it by saying, um, one, I can't write, and two, uh, uh, I have nothing to particularly important to say. And, uh, <clears throat> and he said, well, that isn't true, and then he introduced me to, or didn't introduce me, he suggested I write it with a reporter for the New York Times, who I know very well, and, and um, I had lunch with him, and he changed my mind, and then he was going to write it with me, and then turned out the editor wouldn't let him do it because I was still somebody that was occasionally covered by the Times. Um, so I was on my own bottom. And um, somebody told me about Dragon Dictate. And um, so I began to write it and ultimately got a wonderful friend, Suzanne Garman, to turn my turgid prose into something that I think is, is quite readable. Um, I want to say two things. I, I <clears throat> I be passionately believe in politics and public service. The only thing I'm going to read from this is a quote at the beginning of the book from Plato, uh, which is something I passionately, which sums up the book. One of the penalties of good men's refusing to participate in politics is that they end up being governed by their inferiors. Uh, and I do believe that, that um, the level of activity and a willingness of people to get into the trenches and get involved in politics is absolutely the key. Nothing in a democracy ever changes but for politics. And uh, there is a discouraging attitude, particularly amongst so many of the people and 
in leadership roles in our professions and in our commerce who sort of turn their nose up at politics, thinks politics is a dirty word. Um, and it's used, politician is almost a pejorative uh, uh, connotation in many people's language. And <clears throat> that has not been my experience. Yeah, there are, there are always a few crooks and there are always a few bums, but those same characteristics apply to people in every walk of life. Um, what is important, however, is that <clears throat> at a point in history when we're facing a domestic challenge that isn't fully recognized, which I'm going to describe in a second, uh, we don't have the quality of people in politics who are willing to take, make the tough decisions, face up to the unbelievable challenge that lies ahead, and and. <clears throat> and are, who are willing to undertake the, the, the burdens, which often can be political unpopularity to address them. And the problem essentially is that we made a lot of promises as a society to people who lent us money, to people who worked for us. Uh, we made a lot of promises to the public with respect to the level of benefits that they would get at varying points in their life. And it turns out that we don't have the resources to meet those promises. And that is true at almost every level uh, of government, but it's particularly true for states and cities. And <clears throat> people often forget what we learned in high school, that under our Constitution, states have the responsibility for public safety, for the public infrastructure, for education. Uh, and their costs of meeting those obligations are paid for roughly by 70% of their own tax revenues and about 30% of what they get from the federal government. And when the federal government is addressing its budget deficit by cutting expenses, when health care costs are rising dramatically faster than um, state and local revenues and indeed faster than the rate of inflation and when pension funds are increasingly and dramatically underfunded where there are many states like New Jersey and Illinois where they they don't even bother to make the contributions even though there are constitutional promises and guarantees to the beneficiaries of those funds uh, we are facing a essentially an unsustainable uh, system for many of the jurisdictions in this country. And, and that problem is not being adequately addressed. The, the, there are now something like 11 cities in bankruptcy that I know of, the most dramatic being Detroit. Um, Detroit is, is by far the most egregious example. That city has been suffering demographically and economically for a long time. And they kicked the can down the road by borrowing money, basically, that they had no prospect whatsoever of repaying. Um, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, $72 billion of debt, 3 million people. They just borrowed $3 billion more in the market, 9% interest, that they have absolutely no way whatsoever of paying that back. Zero way. Um, and uh, the SEC is prohibited from exercising by law any supervision over the issuance of municipal securities. Um, <clears throat> and the federal government is uh, uh, attentive, uh, and some people in it are extremely interested uh, in the problem, but they have not been willing to get involved lest they get entrapped into the pressure to write a check, which understandably they can't do. The moral hazard of writing a check for Detroit or Puerto Rico or San Bernardino or sh Chicago, which is in serious trouble, or any of the upstate cities in New York, I understand. But they're not willing to, to put discipline into the process either and prevent this problem from growing, and it will grow unless um, the fairy godmother descends or there's a rampant rate of inflation that bails out all old promises, creates new problems. So that's what this book is about. And I think what ultimately <clears throat> I tried to do
was tell the story as if it, for some peculiar reason, has never been told about how close New York City came to bankruptcy in 1975. And I, it's a great story, and I didn't uh, tell it all because it would, it's, it's worthy of a book uh, that somebody will write someday. The fact that nobody wrote it in the interim is amazing to me because it basically tells the story of how the city of New York, with the aid and encouragement and statutory enablement by Governor Rockefeller, solved its deficits by borrowing money. For nine years, they borrowed every year an amount of money in an amount sufficient to pay off the dollars that they borrowed the previous year, plus enough to cover the deficit in the current year. And finally, the music stopped. And <clears throat> that's what's happening all over the place. Uh, states are doing this, cities are doing this. There is no standard whatsoever for defining or requiring what cities and states, that, that cities and states have to <clears throat> match their recurring revenues with their recurring expenditures. And as long as they could treat borrowed funds or the, the proceeds of the sale of assets as revenues for budget balancing purposes, uh, they're getting into deeper and tr deeper trouble, and that's what they're doing. Arizona sold its state capital, treated the proceeds of the sale as a revenue for budget balancing purposes, and of course leased it back since they have to occupy it. Um, New York State sold a jail to a public benefit corporation, leased it back. I, I could tell you a lot of examples. So. My reason, <clears throat> my real reason for writing this book and my real reason for, for being eager to talk about it, uh, whoever might listen around the country, is because I think that this is a problem that has to be seriously considered. And the Congress is ducking it and um, politicians are ducking it. As long as there is a way, primarily through borrowing, to kick the can down the road, these deficits are accumulating, and these obligations are accumulating. Um, just to give you a sense of the enormity of the obligation, I would say that most thoughtful people who study this subject believe that the public pension funds in the United States are underfunded by close to $3 trillion. Uh, and when you consider that there is <clears throat> amongst people of the political right a desire to modify those obligations as a way of saving money. But for those who believe that a, a promise to pay interest to somebody who lends you money is morally equivalent to the promise to pay a benefit to somebody who worked for you for 20 years, uh, if you have that conviction, then uh, you're not going to solve the fiscal problem by eliminating benefits to public servants, nor are you going to increase the quality of people who are willing to devote their life to public service um, by reducing uh, uh, the benefits accordingly. So that's what it's about. I, um, again, appreciate everybody coming and uh, answer any questions anybody might have. Rod. Could you use a microphone? Have you just taken on another job in order to try uh, and I reduce something? I have just been um, appointed as special advisor to the bankruptcy judge in Detroit. And what do you think the future of that enterprise you've taken on is? Uh, I don't know yet, and if I did, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say anything about <laughs> it at this point. Uh, but I'm beginning to delve into a lot of numbers and a lot of problems and understand it in some detail. Um, could I get you to go through a little bit of the Municipal Assistance Corporation gyrations, particularly around Al Shanker's role in, in at the point in stabilizing um, the city. Sure. 
Um, I'm sorry, my friend John, Maureen, come sit up front. Could you help Mr. Sweeney and... Um, the story is, uh, in a nutshell, is <clears throat> that city had all these maturing one-year obligations when the banks said they were no longer willing to continue to finance the city with one-year loans. So we had in the year 1975 a series of maturing almost every month, hundred multi-hundreds of billions, a total of eight and a half billion dollars of, of maturing paper. So the most exigent problem was to convert it to long-term debt so that we didn't have to come up with the cash, which we had no way of doing. And the Municipal Assistance Corporation <coughs> was created to, <coughs> for the purpose of having a vehicle that could sell long-term bonds. And we took the sales tax away from the city of New York and pledged it to this state public benefit corporation, which then sold bonds secured by the, the sales tax, which no longer was received by the city. But that did not solve the problem of the deficit that the city was running at. That required um, <clears throat> the state taking over uh, city functions. It required unions agreeing to take uh, to, to wage freezes, layoffs, reduced pension benefits, took the banks to agree to moratorium on the payment of interest. And uh, New York was blessed <clears throat> by having an extraordinary man, my name is Hugh Carey, as governor, who was, uh, had this extraordinary skill to understand all of the complicated financial issues and at the same time have a great political sense in the best in the best sense I you can use the word he he could converse with Walter Riston the head of Citibank who in many ways was a little to the right of Marie Antoinette uh, and at the same time sit down with Vic Opama who was head of the um, city workers union AFSCME union in New York um, whose <clears throat> both his language and his political philosophy were not exactly the same as Walter Riston's. Uh, and he could, and Hugh Carey, they both ended up uh, trusting Hugh Carey. And that was a very important part of this because this was, uh, there was so much need for trust and confidence. Um, the Al Shanker story is that despite the creation of that, there was still a lot of reluctance to buy the bonds that were sold by Mac. And there was an agreement finally in the summer <clears throat> of 75 that <clears throat> the banks would buy some of these bonds and the union pension funds would buy some of these bonds. And <clears throat> uh, on this particular day, uh, October 17th, there was a $150 million bond issue due, uh, or note issue due, and it was to be paid off as a result of the sale of $150 million of MAC bonds, which were to be purchased by the Teachers Pension Fund in New York. Um, on the day before, coincidentally, the governor had asked me to come to Washington to brief the staff of the Senate Banking Committee about the problems of New York. And the chief of staff, who had been a protege of Paul Douglas's, most of you are too young to remember who he was, but great senator from the state of Illinois, uh, was, was the chief staff person at the Senate Banking Committee. So I was, <clears throat> I was in Washington with Peter Goldmark, who was the state budget director, and Dave Burke, who was chief of staff to the governor, who just passed away. I don't know if you know that, Martha. Passed away two days ago. Yes. And um, and um, we were very close. And um, he, um, we came back, 
we flew back from Washington and called the governor uh, when we landed to give him a report on the day, and he said Shanker had called him and told him he had decided he can't make the investment after all. Um, and I, I was worried sick because we didn't have adequate plans how you're going to get food and medicine to the hospitals, to the children, uh, daycare centers, et cetera, in the city. And um, I remember going off to some fancy charitable dinner, and I got disgusted, went home early, got into bed, and about 10 o'clock, Governor Carey called me and asked me to come to his office. So I got dressed and got in a cab and went down to 55th Street. And um, he said, uh, you got to find Al Shanker and get him to change his mind. <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure how he knew I knew Shanker. I knew Shanker, we were actually quite good friends because uh, I was very close to Bayard Rustin and to the Civil Rights Movement. And the A. Philip Randolph Institute and Bayard Rustin had their officers in the UFT headquarters in, on 25th Street and Park Avenue. And that's really how Al and I became good friends. He was also a great chef and um, terrific human being. And um, so <clears throat> I finally located Al, met him at midnight, said, Al, uh, you got to do this. The city's going to go bankrupt. He said, um, Dick, he said, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. I have a fiduciary obligation of the retirees. I can't invest the money uh, uh, and run the risk of losing it. On the other hand, obviously, I don't want the city to go bankrupt. We talked for four hours whether an individual can make a difference. Finally, at about four or five o'clock, he said, Dick, I've got to check with a few people. I'll go home and I'll call you at home and at eight o'clock. I went home, showered, sat there. And kids went off to school. Uh, my wife went off to work. And I turned on the television set, it's 8.39, I hadn't heard from Shanker, and there's a report. The city of New York is going bankrupt. I didn't know what to do. I got in a cab and I went down to Governor Carey's office, and there was massive numbers of press there, and I walked into the governor's office, and then just as his secretary, uh, Kate O'Connor, came in and said, uh, Mr. Shanker's calling him. So Shanker says, I'm at Gracie Mansion with Mayor Bean, but I want to meet with you and the governor privately, and I don't want to come to the governor's office. I don't want to see the press. Um, so it so happened that the apartment I lived in was midway between the governor's office and, and the mayor's uh, residence in New York City, so we met at my apartment. And at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Shanker agreed to change his mind and make the investment. And uh, I then... Uh, the governor left, <clears throat> and um, all of a sudden I realized that note holders were going to the banks uh, to present their notes for payment, the, the city notes that were due that day. And I realized to make sure that there was no default that had to keep the banks open. So I called the state banking superintendent, said, can you keep the banks open all day until tonight? He said, we only have jurisdiction over one bank. So. He said, if you want to keep the, um, the other banks open, <clears throat> you'll have to get the controller of the currency in Washington to do it. <laughs> and I said, I have no idea who the controller of the currency is. <laughs> and he said, well, the only one who could do that is the chairman of the clearinghouse. So I said, who's the chairman of the clearinghouse? And he said, the chairman of the Morgan Bank, Pat Patterson. Well, the ravages didn't hop not with the Pattersons in the ordinary course of life. So, uh, but believe it or not, I finally got them on the phone, and they kept the banks open till midnight. And that that was the story. I'm sorry for a long story, but that's a good one. It's a good one. What? I I believe if I remember correctly, it was 150 or 200 million. You know, that day. Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, I had a question, oh, actually. Sorry. First. Um, what are your thoughts about um, states like Maryland that have balanced budget requirements? Um, do you think that that is maybe 
some step toward a solution of avoiding these bankruptcies in the future? And, and I guess the second part of my question is, if it is, then why aren't more states adopting this process? Good question. Every state has a, either a constitutional or a statutory requirement to have a balanced budget, but no state defines what revenue is. So therefore, if you defer paying a bill for services rendered for school aid to cities until the first day of the next fiscal year, you have balanced this year's budget. If you borrow to balance your budget and there are trillions of dollars of outstanding debts around the country that were incurred in order to have balanced budgets, or if you sell assets. Uh, um, <clears throat> In New York State, um, they passed a law in order to avoid raising taxes uh, <clears throat> or cutting anything else. They passed a law which permitted um, the state to make the contribution to the pension system in the form of promissory notes. That's a borrowing. Um, and uh, I've had occasion to talk to uh, Governor O'Malley a couple of times, and I think in many respects he's one of the most impressive people on this subject, but they're not without having engaged in some of these practices as well. Okay. And yes. Hi. Hi. So I'm so glad you told that story, and I'm so glad that you've written this book because the story about New York needed to be told. I had the good fortune to meet a gentleman, um, John Connerton, who filled me in on some of the details about what happened. And what struck me in his telling and your telling is how idiosyncratic it was. It was a couple of personalities, people who happened to know each other. Um, uh, one of the details he told me was that there was something that required that New York had a balanced budget. Um, so much like your answer to the last question, um, no one defined what balanced meant. And so then there was sort of a last minute reprieve where it was something like any budget real or contemplated um, that is in balance. And it's easy to balance your budget in your mind, I guess, and so that ended up being okay. But I guess if you had to come up with a more systematic solution that didn't require on these idiosyncratic features, what would it be? I mean, what, what should well, the federal I, government I, do? I have to tell you, the most significant thing we did in 1975 was to pass a law requiring that the city of New York budget in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And New York has never had a fiscal crisis since then. We've had political but battles about level of services, uh, taxes, but we've never had a fiscal crisis. We've never ever faced the possibility of not being able to pay an obligation that we had. And that's the answer nationally. If every state and every city were required to match its recurring revenues and its recurring expenditures, we wouldn't have those kinds of problems. And it's just the fact that just the opposite, because they can borrow and because they can treat borrow, borrow proceeds as revenues that ultimately catch up and get these jurisdictions into trouble. So there is a solution, but it takes politicians with a lot of guts. Mm -hmm. okay. And there are not as many of those around as I wish there were. Um, I don't know. Is this um, as Hi. you described, the uh, New York State and many of the actors in New York City were all very supportive of the city in the fiscal crisis. Uh, there were certainly disputes. I get the impression it's rather the opposite in Michigan uh, with the governor. Detroit has been systematically isolated from more um, uh, affluent areas. So how do you expect to tackle well, the Detroit you're, you're problem? you're absolutely right it, and, um, in that sense that New York City was you know, almost 50% of the population of the state of New York in 1975, and it was certainly the biggest generator of tax revenue for the state. It was the center of finance, the center of entertainment, the center of, of communications in the United States. So uh, Detroit is 9% of the population of the state of Michigan, and um, far less significant uh, politically to the state government and to the people elected to the state government. So there is far less reason uh, for the state to, uh, and uh, far less political compulsion for the state to do that. 
Um, but um, <clears throat> I, I have not met the governor, so I can't comment on, on his attitude. I do know that the state is scheduled to appropriate, this has been in the press, $300 million to help um, avoid the sale of the art in the art museum uh, uh, so that the at least there will be some uh, pension payments made to the retirees in Detroit. Um, that's really a critical issue. You have a, cops, firemen, teachers, a lot of people who, whose pensions have been eviscerated for a lot of different reasons, uh, and they're not eligible for Social Security, and that's a very important human part of this, this whole dilemma out there. Steve. Yes. Uh, I'd like to take you back to the issue of uh, labor and government and uh, bankers cooperating, which is not the case today. But specifically to ask you about the role of labor and the leadership of the labor movement, because when you talk about pensions and benefits, you're really talking about workers in the cities and states. Uh, to what I'd like you to answer as candidly and as as you can about about whether you think l the labor movement is facing up to its obligations the way the unions did in New York in the 1970s. Um, I'll try to answer it as best I can. First of all, um, uh, I knew the labor leaders in New York. I had a personal relationship with them. As I said, Al Shaka was a friend, Vic Gopan was a friend, um, uh, their advisor, Jack Beagle, was a, a friend. And, and um, But much more importantly than that, um, they were all people with both the intelligence to understand the consequences of the actions they took. And second of all, it was a um, they were confronted with uh, 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 the existence of something called the Emergency Financial Control Board, which was created uh, by the state to uh, supervise what the city of New York was doing to get out of the fiscal crisis. And uh, the Control Board never did anything, but its very existence enabled the labor leaders to say to their members that if we don't agree to do the things that are necessary, or our share of what's necessary to avoid bankruptcy, then the Control Board will make us do it. Or the co and bankruptcy will abrogate all our collective bargaining agreements. So there'll be no need to have a union if you have no collective bargaining agreements. So it became a, a means which enabled the, the union leaders who were trying genuinely to help solve the problem, but it gave them the ability to, to persuade their members that the give-ups that they were being asked to make were appropriate. Um, the rest of the labor movement uh, uh, was, was very helpful and very supportive. Um, the building trades were concerned uh, <coughs> about the potential bankruptcy, because that meant probably very little public investment in the future in the infrastructure, which in a town where 95% of the construction was, was, was union. So they were very supportive. It's slightly different today. One, pensions weren't really an issue then. Remember, uh, there wasn't collective bargaining with public employees until the 60s. So there wasn't really, the, the pensions were not a serious issue in the 70s um, <clears throat> yet. Um, <clears throat> today, it's more difficult. The union movement uh, and its distinguished uh, former president is here and a dear friend and a wonderful man and I, I hope he'll kick me uh, afterwards if I don't state the facts accurately, but the um, union movement is suffering a lot of difficulty. There's great unemployment in this country. Uh, there 
an increasing number of people elected to office who want to meet the fiscal problem by reducing the the uh, uh, negotiating power of unions, who want to reduce, as I said earlier, benefits to public employees, who want to cut back on health care costs. Um, and um, that creates uh, an enormous pressure. So declining membership uh, and a growing difference in many cases between the the uh, private unions and the public unions, because the public unions <coughs> um, have these pension benefits that are in most jurisdictions constitutionally or legislatively guaranteed, whereas the um, the uh, employees, the private employees who are union members, don't have anywhere near that level of promise. Uh, in some cases, the, the Taft-Hartley funds have an obligation of the um, uh, PBGC, but that that's subject to congressional appropriation, and uh, the amount of that contingent li liability is staggering and way beyond the capacity of the PBGC to meet it. So there is a good reason for for every working person in the United States to to understand that they have more in common than they have what divides them. But I can in candor tell you that I, I don't sadly observe some serious, uh, you know, tensions within the labor movement over this. I, I hope that answered your question. Um, yes, sir. Um, so there was great debate and resistance to the federal government's bailout of the auto companies a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, much of it partisan, much of it ideological, uh, much of it attempting to pit labor against capital, right, and labor being given a de facto mm -hmm. priority uh, because of political payback and so forth. Do you see any parallels between that situation and what, what's happening in the, in the states and municipalities? Um, that well, is, what, what, will the, what will the reaction ultimately be of the capital markets? Well, I, I wasn't personally, obviously, uh, I'm familiar with the details of that. I know that the restructuring that occurred in 2009 was largely done by a very, very talented guy who had worked for the Steelworkers Union for a number of years, Ron Bloom. Uh, and I, I don't think anybody today argues with the result. They saved tens and upon tens of thousands of jobs and the public cost was de minimis, lost in the sea of other things that have happened since. So it isn't even controversial anymore. Uh, um, I think, number two, that um, um, the uh, markets today uh, are, um, I think, Bewildered. I have no expertise on this, and I probably shouldn't offer any observation. But you know, you've got 60 million people who are employed part time in the United States today, and that's a staggering statistic. Who aren't getting any benefits, mm -hmm. and their employers want to maintain a lot of part time employees because the cost of making them full time employees is is uh, reduces reduces profits. Um, so I think our economy is changing a lot, and I I have I have no um, you know no wisdom as to where it's all going to come out. But uh, um, it's interesting. I haven't read it yet. I probably should buy it from our distinguished host today before I leave. But I've read a lot about Mr. Piketty's book, and um, um, makes makes a lot of sense. At least what I've read about it. And uh, we have a, a growing problem in the United States in the growing redistribution of, of wealth um, that I think we're going to have to address. But it's not my, I don't have enough wisdom to give you the answer to that. Thank you. And if you don't mind, this will be the last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you. OK, so on that note, since States and commonwealths are different from municipalities. Yes. And so they can't go bankrupt. Yes. 
So what are their options? How do they work? How does Arizona come out of this? How does Puerto Rico come out of this? Let me explain. Um, states can't file. Bankrupt is a, both a term of art and a legal word that describes a state, a condition under federal law. But we use the word bankrupt to mean if somebody's broke, they're bankrupt. Uh, but bankrupt has a particular narrow meaning. The 11th Amendment to the Constitution does not permit states to file because it says that a federal court can't have jurisdiction between a lawsuit of a citizen of one state and a citizen or in another state, and therefore bankruptcy would involve just that, and that's why states can't file. Uh, cities can file under the federal bankruptcy statute if they have statutory permission from their state, and only 31 states have granted that permission um, to cities and local governments. And you remember, cities are creatures, uh, constitutional creatures of state governments. The state legislature of New York could uh, abolish the sit government of the city of New York in one fell stroke if they wanted to. Politically, they're not going to, but they could. In the same way that the governor of Michigan, for good purposes, uh, <coughs> appointed what is known as a manager to take over the governmental functions of the mayor of Detroit uh, during this period of great stress. Um, the, your question is a very, very good one, and there are scholars and uh, people and institutions like the Urban Institute and uh, the um, uh, uh, many associations around. I have these discussions with some of the thoughtful, able people at AFSCME and the AFT, and everybody's very interested in this, whether we should develop some other kind of mechanism uh, to resolve these things. Uh, and um, so it, it's very much an open question, and I think it's going to happen with greater and greater frequency. But as long as politicians think that the best way to get elected is to, to keep taxes down and, and, and modify obligations, that's going to create a whole different political complexion in the future and that's where we are at this point in time and I don't <clears throat> I don't think it's going to get resolved until the next presidential election in many ways and I also want to say to you that this, the <clears throat> situation could produce an incredibly anachronistic result in that for example a city could file bankruptcy, and the judge found that the federal bankruptcy law preempted the Michigan constitutional promise that the pension obligations would be paid. So therefore, the retirees had no uh, guarantee, and they're going to get what ultimately if there is a bankruptcy plan approved by the judge, they will get some percentage of what they expected to get, but not 100% of what they got, for sure. Um, but on the other hand, because the state can't file, what happens if, if uh, the, the employees of the state face the same dilemma? The state just doesn't have the money. It can't file bankruptcy. Well, nobody knows what the answer to that is. But, and I'll conclude with this, because in many ways this is the most interesting thing of all. In, when we were negotiating with the White House and the Treasury Department in 1975, they insisted that before they would even consider any assistance to New York, that we agreed to pass a law to suspend all interest payments on New York City's debt. And the banks, so terrified of bankruptcy, went along with that all the big banks that held most of those bonds. Um, it was a very gutsy thing, uh, as Governor Carey, he did a lot of gutsy things, but that, that was particularly gutsy. Two years later, the highest court in the state of New York said that law was unconstitutional, that New York State had to use its taxing power to meet its obligations. <laughs> 
So if that is the law, ultimately, then the answer is the greatest risk of states continuing this kind of profligate borrowing is confiscatory levels of taxation, if that is the ultimate law. But nobody knows. And it's a subject of interesting discourse at, in law schools and in the bankruptcy bar. And, uh, and we're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of uncharted territory. Steve. Just a comment, Mr. Uh, Roberts, Lieutenant Governor. Um, this is a good It's so He's impressive to see leg. the uh, command you have of such a vast array of complicated and difficult issues and the ability you've shown through a long and remarkable career to get into the public sector and to solve difficult problems. So as one citizen here, uh, I want to salute you and thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you, Steve.